Today I'm going to talk something about a uh, not very well-known topic. It's machine learning on source code, or how we shorten it inside our company and you know, force it on Twitter, ML on code. Um, I start with the following Python code snippet. Um, there is a class named settings, and it contains a method get with an argument key. And we are about to type the second method, uh, which starts with s. So what do you think we'll type next? Uh, obviously, set, right? Uh, settings, you can get them, you can set them. But the problem is that all IDEs which I checked out, uh, their auto-completion, auto-suggestion uh, system is not able to display uh, and suggest what we are going to type next. It's just uh, completely uh, helpless. Uh, obviously, the modern way of how we do code assistance in IDEs and editors can be improved. But uh, how can we improve it? Uh, and it's a really good question. And the first, time, uh, por first part of my talk will try to answer this question. Uh, I will review the following two trends. And the first is machine learning uh, itself. No need to go really verbose here. Everybody knows about deep learning. Uh, also, there are some super exciting advancements in natural language processing. Uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, machine translation improved dramatically, the quality increased, and also we even have some robots now calling people uh, by phone and ordering haircuts. Uh, obviously, ordering haircuts not for robots, but for people. Uh, the second trend is uh, open source. And the open source phenomenon is, is great. Uh, the amount of repositories on GitHub, for example, grows uh, roughly two times uh, every several years. So it's, it's so exciting. It's enormous amount of data. We tried to estimate it and source it, and uh, it appeared to be petabyte scale. Uh, so this data is open, and everybody uses it at the moment just you know for the primary goal as a software. But what if we can? Uh, try to analyze it and for at least infer some best practices from the source code. It's an enormous amount of data. So if we combine advancements in machine learning and uh, a large amount of input data, we will go to machine learning on source code or, again, as we call it, ML on code because it's much shorter and easier to say. Uh, one of the... Uh, important aspects in machine learning on source code is the hypothesis of code naturalness. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's a cool one because it shows you the difference between how you write software as a human and how machines execute your code afterwards. And the difference is obvious. Uh, and to demonstrate it, uh, I will show you two examples. The first is uh, this Python snippet again. Uh, it, is a class with a mysterious name. And it has three methods, connect, query, and close. Query has SQL argument, connect has DB name, user password, so on and so forth. So how do you think we should name this class? Uh, well, probably database, right? Because uh, everything just uh, for this name. But we don't really know the contents of these methods. Uh, we don't see inside, it's just, you know, uh, how we perceive this. Uh, it's one of the examples of naturalness. And the second is about metasyntactic variables. Uh, again, we see some class uh, named foo, really bad name for a class. Some methods bar and bus, uh, we have really no idea what they do. And the third method is named do and contains a very shady argument, really. So uh, probably this code is bad. I would not use it in production in whatever else is inside these methods. Uh, this is my expectation. I'm not really sure, but uh, as a human, I, I suggest that. So yeah, this is called naturalness. And there is a way to actually qualitatively uh, measure this naturalness and try to use it in some real-world application. And this method is uh, identifier embeddings. You can try to take uh, names in the source code uh, and try to map them to dense vectors. Uh, every foobar, any, anything gets mapped to a dense vector, 
And they have a cool property that if identifiers often appear in the same context, they are related to each other, the distance between them should be smaller than the distance between completely unrelated identifiers, which have nothing to do with each other. So we can define the distance between vectors as usual uh, using a cosine distance, basically the angle between vectors. And this cosine distance uh, depends on the scalar product of these vectors. And uh, so far, so good. If we have a way to estimate the scalar product of our embedding vectors, we can try to train some model and find these dense vectors. How can we estimate them? I will show you how. Uh, iteratively, uh, we have an example, Python code again. Sorry, I love Python. Uh, so a class named database, just on the previous one, uh, has connect method, which tries to open a raw TCP connection, authenticates, and catches some errors if they happen. So we will extract identifiers from this code. But we will not do it in a brute force way, because our vocabulary size will explode if we apply it to uh, petabytes of source code. So we will split identifiers, and we will normalize them. Uh, splitting is basically extracting subtokens uh, separated by the underscore or by case change. And normalization maps similar identifiers to the same identifier. Uh, so we start with the outer scope, take all identifiers, uh, rec record how many times we encountered each, and then we build a graph. And the nodes of this graph are our identifiers, and the edges of this graph uh, correspond to the multiplied frequencies of the corresponding identifiers occurred in that context. So this is how it may look like. All identifiers grouped in a graph, and the brightness and thickness of each edge corresponds to uh, the product of the frequencies. We go down, we traverse the abstract syntax tree of this source code, and take the method itself, do the same, uh, find the new weights of each edge, and we sum with the previous graph. And we get this. As you see, identifiers which uh, occurred together many times, they have brighter connections. They are tend to group together. We just take the function signature, then uh, again update the graph. We take the first line. We take the try set block. We take the uh, inside of this uh, tri set block, go on and on and on, update the graph, until finally we build our final graph for the source code snippet. Now, look attentively at this graph. Does it resemble you something? Who thinks it's a dot logo? All right. So indeed, it resembles a dot logo, but it Apart from that, it also defines an incidence matrix, because as we know, every graph can be represented by its incidence matrix. Actually, in our context, in machine learning context, uh, we would rather name it a concurrence matrix, because the, each cell of this matrix corresponds to how many times uh, this indexed pair of identifiers occurred together. And we use this concurrence matrix to estimate the scalar product of each pair of embedding vectors using pointwise mutual information. So pointwise mutual information function is a nice one. Uh, it is rather complex, but it only depends on the cells of our concurrence matrix. And it is theoretically proven that if we define our scalar product in that way, our distance property will hold. And we will reach our goal. We will find a way uh, to state our problem and maybe then train our uh, model to find the dense vectors. Awesome. So how will we do that? Through representation learning on the explicit co-occurrence matrix. In contrast to such methods as Wartovec, SIBO, uh, Skibgram, they all work on implicit co-occurrence matrix. And here we go explicit. And the way we will train our dense vectors will be through stochastic gradient descent. 
we will uh, take our co-occurrence matrix. This is how it looks like for uh, first, let's say, 10,000 identifiers, more or less. It is very sparse. Uh, we will take this matrix and iteratively update the dense vector through propagation of the error of the difference between the actual PMI and the PMI which we've just calculated. Uh, we do maybe 100 iterations, and here we go. And the problem is that we cannot do this on this co-occurrence matrix directly because it's huge. Uh, the typical matrix for uh, the whole GitHub, which we measured, is about one million identifiers uh, per site. And as you imagine, uh, the matrix multiplication, which is involved in a SGD, stochastic gradient descent, uh, it's a cubic complexity. And uh, it will just be too slow to multiply such giant large matrices, even though they're sparse. So what we do instead is share this matrix. We randomly shuffle the rows and columns of this matrix. And also, we ensure that the roughly amount of elements in each shard is the same. Then we take each shard independently and backpropagate on it. We can do it in parallel. So it's a really handy way. And it's, I've just described how Swivel works. Swivel is a model uh, appeared in 2016 at Google. Uh, it's, it's a really cool one. There is a paper on Archiv, so you can read it if you're interested. Uh, it supports uh, GPU acceleration. It runs distributed and uh, implemented on TensorFlow. Also, it is claimed that it is better than word 2 ec or even Glove. Uh, I must note that the Swivel model does not really depend on the nature of the co-occurrence matrix. So we can use it for any type of data which can be represented as a matrix. Uh, this is very cool. Uh, so. OK, we figure out that we will train identifiers in that way. But uh, the only problem which is left unsolved is how will we traverse millions of source code files? And we need to define a pipeline to extract identifiers at scale. And as with many other machine learning on source code applications, uh, we can imagine this pipeline as this pyramid. So we start at the bottom and we climb at the top. We first uh, understand and discover the GitHub repositories which we want to process, uh, maybe querying GitHub API. Then we clone them, fetch them. Uh, it is hard to do at scale, believe me. And when we traverse the Git history, take the main branch, take the head revision, we filter the files which are unrelated, classify the rest into programming languages, parse them, and finally do some payload. Uh, instead of uh, manually cloning uh, repositories by hand, it is tedious. You can instead use public Git archive at PJ source tech. It's our data set. It contains all roughly 200,000 Git repositories, which are already cloned. You just fetch them through HTTP, and it is about 100 times faster. So that's cool. And uh, the last part of my talk is devoted to results of training identifier embeddings on public Git archive. Uh, this is what you get. The nearest identifiers to foo are other metasyntactic variables, uh, cooks, bus, weeble, lots of them. You can also do analogies as with regular word to ec You can understand that send is to receive, for example, as push is to pop. Or bug is to test, uh, bug minus test plus expect is the same as suppress, which makes sense, right? You can even find typos. Uh, it appears that many people misspell identifiers. I know that it happens in Stack Overflow a lot, for example. Uh, so uh, since they tend to be in the same context always, this is what you get. You find the closest ones, and you get the misprinted names. Returning to the example at the beginning of my talk, our class settings, what we are going to type next, we will solve this minimization problem. We, we, we scan through all our candidates, all possible identifiers which start with S, and minimize the sum of distances from that candidate to settings, get, and key. And this is what we get. We have set, this is the closest one. We also have save, step, 
or even sneak, uh, sneak sneaking settings, so funny. Uh, to conclude, the way we write source code, our coding experience can be improved. And one of the ways to improve it is to go deeper, not just do some empirical and heuristical uh, approaches. We can use naturalness, software naturalness in source code. And so identifier embeddings are a cool way of expressing this called naturalness. And we train them, leveraging the context and the structure of the source code. And the final conclusion is doing machine learning on source code is fun. And just one example of what I just presented, there are many others. Uh, you can go to uh, mining software repositories conference proceedings, for example, and read a lot of more papers about that. Uh, this is all I wanted to say. Uh, let me thank Frances Campo and Sylvain for helping me with this presentation.